Brent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Administrator, thank you for being in front of our committee today. I appreciate your work and your interest in Alabama. Your reference to Uniontown is something that I appreciate. It's something that I've been working on for years. Actually, as a staffer in this very building, got to work under Senator Shelby's leadership to help secure a $23.4 million grant from USDA Rural Development to get to work on this very issue. Additionally, we added that to Congresswoman Terry Sewell's work on the house side with a $1.8 million um, revenue stream moving to help fix this problem. We certainly know and believe um, that we have to upgrade and repair these systems and so certainly look forward to looking, working with you moving forward. Absolutely. As you know, Congress was disapproved um, a few weeks ago of EPA's new WOTUS rule, and I'm grateful that Alabama is currently protected from its impacts by a federal court ruling. When farmers wake up early in the morning to take on their day, from feeding their cows to mending fences to planting to harvesting, they have enough on their plate. They should not have to worry that ponds, ditches, or mud holes on their private land are federally regulated. The uncertainty of Biden's WOTUS rule has created and continues to create unsustainable state of shifting permitting in this country. The cost is hundreds of thousands of dollars for Americans to comply with ever-changing regulations. Alabamians shouldn't need to pay a lawyer to find out if a ditch on their land is now federally regulated. Mr. Administrator, when the EPA calculated the economic cost and um, benefits of the new Biden WOTUS rule, did the EPA consider the impact of that uncertainty that was created by the ambiguity? You know, thank you for, for the question. And, uh, you know, I, I think that I'd like to, to say that I have tried my best. I've met with more of our ad constituency than any administrator prior Appreciate to that. me. And I also know, though, that the, the ambiguity isn't just solely on EPA. I think multiple Supreme Courts have weighed in on this. At least three to four administrations have tried to get this right. What we've done is we've taken a look at what the courts have ruled prior, what the Supreme Court has said prior, and we attempted to put a rule in place that was much more durable legally than we've seen in the Do past. Do you think it had an economic impact? Well, I think that everything that we do uh, can have a Plus or, plus or minus economic impact, which is why we work so hard to provide the certainty that other administrations have failed to provide so far. So on the primary economic analysis um, on this WOTUS rule, it said it would have no economic impact, and you signed off on that. Do you agree with that assessment? I, I think that um, your question in terms of uncertainty of the economic impact is one that uh, we, I, I would not say reject the premise of the question, but the economic uh, assessment that we do is based on our legal assessment of what the law requires uh, and what we put in place so that farmers do have the certainty to comply with the rule. And I will say that work very closely with Secretary Vilsack at USDA to be sure that as we implemented the rule, we'd be able to leverage resources across the federal family. So we believed that the economic impact would be positive because we thought that the farmers and the farmer community would have some certainty. Well, I can assure you that there are economic impacts, and um, unfortunately, many of those have been negative. In Alabama alone, SBC says over 64,000 small businesses have been, been impacted by this, and that's 165,000 employees. Um, so I, I am of the belief that our cattlemen, our foresters, and our farmers um, have tended to their land for generation upon generation. And they actually uh, depend on the fruitfulness of that land to continue to do the job that they love. And I believe that food security is national security. And if we can't feed or clothe ourselves, nothing else matters. So I appreciate your attention to the negative economic impacts um, that have come as a result of this. I've noticed a pattern of concern from people coming to my office um, discussing the EPA. Many have feared that the EPA is regulating past what science will support or technology that's available. Just to put it bluntly, Alabamians fear that EPA regulations are more predicted based on the Green New Deal ideology than that of the science and technology before us. With PFAS, the current EPA proposal stretches the limits of what can be consistently tested. Complying with the levels proposed Proposed, even if possible, would divert millions of dollars from needed infrastructure upgrades. And worse, the term that I continue to hear from people is bankruptcy. For power plants, there are fears that the EPA will impose technologies that are not, ready ava not readily available or that can actually not be implemented at this time. 
And of course, there's pesticides. In 2021, your agency eliminated the use of chlorpyrifos for soybeans, cotton, and for other crops. In the past, you've said you agreed with USDA on the science of this pesticide, and actually the Secretary of USDA has personally written that there are safe uses to this product. Um, since then, there's been blame that's been shifted to the ban on the Ninth Circuit Court for quote, quote, setting the bar too high. I understand that the band was consistent with obviously the platform uh, with the Democratic Party in 2020, but I get the political dynamics, but I'm asking you, um, what I don't understand is, do you think that there are good uses for this? And if so, how can, how can we get back to utilizing them? Well, I, I think that uh, the Secretary Vilsack and I are, number one, working very closely together. That's great to hear. Uh, number two, we both believe and share science. I think what Secretary Vilsack has said a number of times publicly, and I'll repeat it, is that, uh, you know, USDA has its perspective, hmm. EPA has its, but I'm the one that has to show up in front of the judge. And when the Ninth Circuit set the bar so high that EPA had a burden of proof that historically has never been placed before, we had to make a decision to follow the law. So I think there is a way that you can follow the law and the science, and they may not agree. What about the, 11, the 11 safe uses? Do you feel like we can allow growers, can, can EPA find a way to allow growers to use those? I think that uh, what the EPA has done and will continue to do is try to meet the bar that the Ninth Circuit has set. I think we can talk science uh, for days, and I think we can get to some agreements on sort of impact science. But I think when the courts give you a mandate. Have meet. you appealed that? I, I Has EPA appealed to. that mandate? Um, I, I think EPA presented the best case it could. and the But court, you have not appealed. So let me just be clear that the courts in its writing express serious frustrations with the agency's decisions in the past and express serious frustrations with where we were on clopyrifos, on endangered species and the like. So, you know, you, you can only tempt fate for so many times. And what I pledge to do as administrator is respect the letter of the law. Well, I would hope that you would consider appealing that and helping farmers find a way to use the seven, the 11 safe, safe uses of this. Um, thank you so much for your time. I have run out. Thank you. Hey, before you click on the next video, if y'all could do me a big favor and hit that like button. The algorithm loves it, and so do I, because it helps promote these videos and get the message out about what our government has been doing. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and turn on your notifications because every time I put out a video, you want to know about it, right? Thanks again and have a good one. See you on the next one. Peace.